Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture. In the previous two lectures, we studied frequency domain representation of continuous periodic and aperiodic signals. In this lecture, we are going to talk about frequency domain representation of discrete periodic signals. So, the topic today is uh, frequency domain representation of discrete periodic signals. So, a brief outline of the lecture is as follows. First, we will uh, define what are discrete time signals. Uh, then we will see that what is digital signal processing or discrete time signal processing. Uh, then we will look at what is discretization and what is the process of measurement and discretization. Then we will look at frequency domain representation of discrete periodic signals, uh, which basically will lead to the you know idea of discrete Fourier series. Uh, then we will look at the periodicity property of discrete Fourier series and we will also look at the relationship among the Fourier coefficients of a discrete Fourier series. Uh, then we will look at what is inverse discrete Fourier series and at the end we will take an example to understand uh, you know what is discrete Fourier series. Uh, so, let us uh, first of all look at what are discrete time signals. So, a discrete time signal is a signal in which the independent variable is time uh, and the signal is defined at discrete values of time. Okay. So, discrete time signal is a signal where uh, the independent variable is time and the signal is defined right at discrete values of time. Uh, so, in this signal the amplitude of the signal is continuous right the amplitude of the signal is continuous. it can take any value right. Uh, but if the amplitude is also quantized okay, uh, and discretized and converted to a binary presentation then such a discrete signal then becomes a digital signal. Okay. So, then it becomes a digital signal. So, in a digital signal uh, we have the amplitude is also discretized. and represented in binary form. Okay. Uh, so, now uh, let us see what is DSP, what is uh, discrete time signal processing. It is also sometimes referred as digital signal processing. So, in discrete time signal processing uh, basically the analog signal is discretized and then the discrete version of the analog signal is processed. Uh, so, here the analog signal which basically is another name for continuous signal okay, is discretized okay, and the discrete signal is processed. Okay. So, henceforth now we will refer discrete time signal just as discrete signal right. 
so there is another uh, processing uh, uh, technique called analog signal processing. So in analog signal processing, uh, basically the analog signal is processed using analog circuits uh, and hardware, right? And therefore, the range of functions or the uh, processing signal processing tasks that can be implemented are limited. Uh, so in analog signal processing, analog signal is processed using analog circuits and hardware. So, because analog circuits and hardware is used to process the signal, the range of functions, uh, mathematical functions through which the signal can be processed, they are limited. In DSP, which is uh, digital signal processing or discrete time signal processing, uh, microprocessors are used, right, uh, which basically are based on digital circuits. Uh, so, these processors have high speed and are programmable. Therefore, a very wide range of signal processing tasks can be implemented uh, using uh, digital signal processing and that is why uh, the um, most of the modern signal analyzers they are based on DSP technology, right. Therefore, most modern signal processors are based on DSP technology. So, how discretization is done? So, in DSP, how discretization is done? So, in a DSP processor, uh, you know, the discretization is done using the process of what is called as periodic sampling, right. So, periodic sampling is done right which basically involves uh, recording the signal at uh, after every uh, time interval delta t right this involves recording the signal after interval delta t okay so elapse of every interval delta t the signal is recorded and therefore uh, you know mm, Delta T basically therefore depends on what is the sampling frequency of the signal. Okay. So, sampling frequency uh, often represented by F subscript S is nothing but 1 upon delta T. Okay. That is simply 1 upon delta T. So, this sampling frequency uh, you know of the processor uh, decides that what is this sampling interval delta t. So, therefore, if a continuous signal x of t when it is discretized uh, using uh, frequency f s right, then it is going to lead to uh, you know discrete uh, samples of the signal. And let us say if the, uh, the <coughs> samples are recorded over a length of time capital T and if there are n samples then over that in, over that period then we will have the discrete signal that can be represented as n x n delta t is equal to x naught delta t, then we have x 1 delta t, then we have x 2 delta t uh, going up to x of n minus 1 delta t, right. So, in this way this vector there are n samples, the vector has this uh, uh, recorded signal has n samples. 
Uh, so therefore, this is nothing but a discrete signal. And for simplicity, we can drop delta t and simply represent the discrete signal as x n, which consists of the samples x 1, x 0, x 1, x 2 going up to x n minus 1. So, this is nothing but the discrete signal. Uh, now, how what is the process of measurement and discretization? Uh, let us look at some of the broad steps which are involved in the process of measurement and discretization. So, process of measurement and discretization. So, we can represent it uh, through this uh, simple block diagram. Uh, first, we have the transducer like this, uh, then we have signal conditioner, uh, then we have uh, analog to digital converter so this is nothing but a to d converter and the function of the a to d converter can be represented by two processes and for the uh, purpose of explanation uh, i am representing it as two processes uh, you know in sequence so the first process is process of discretization and the next process is the process of digitization so therefore we have uh, first of all the signal which uh, is uh, analog signal x of t which is sensed by the transducer right and then it is um, you know conditioned by the signal conditioner and that generates a proportionate say voltage signal right so that is typically the most of the you know so that is typically the situation most of the times that a transducer and signal conditioner together converts a uh, signal like say a displacement signal or excitation signal into a proportionate voltage signal so, so therefore, this x of t is an analog signal. Then it converts it to a um, analog voltage signal. Now, A to D converter basically uh, uh, performs the discretization of this signal, right? And that depends on what is the sampling frequency. So, at a certain sampling frequency this discretization uh, process in the A2D converter would convert this analog voltage signal right it will record this analog voltage signal at discrete instance of time uh, okay and uh, the output of this discretization process will be a discrete signal vk right so it's a sequence vk is the discrete signal discrete voltage signal and then the process of digitization will basically uh, uh, quantize the amplitudes of the uh, this discrete uh, you know uh, samples of the signal right and convert them into binary form and at the end of this we will have uh, a dis, uh, uh, digital signal okay vdk so this is a discrete signal vk and then we have a digital signal So, this, these are the basically broad steps through which the signal undergoes right in the process of measurement and discretization. And since we would know that sensitivity of the transducer and signal conditioner together uh, right then it will be possible for us to um, uh, retrieve back the uh, signal in the units of uh, you know analog signal x of t right. So, uh, if I want to know uh, what is the signal uh, say the discrete signal in the units of signal x of t then I can obtain that as uh, using the sensitivity right 
I can divide VK by the sensitivity of the transducer. Right, sensitivity expressed in terms of the voltage per unit, uh, you know, unit of signal x. So in this way, I can find out the discrete signal x k. So in this way, we all, we have now understood that what is discrete signal and how it is recorded. And now we are going to see how this signal is analyzed to obtain the frequency domain representation of this signal. So frequency. domain representation of discrete periodic signal. So here now we are assuming that the signal we have recorded that is say x of n the discrete signal right it is a periodic discrete signal let us say periodic signal. So, this is discrete signal x of n and let us say it is a periodic signal. So, now uh, uh, to obtain the frequency domain representation of this we basically start from the frequency domain representation of a continuous signal of a periodic continuous signal. Now, since x of n is periodic it has a period right. So, it means it repeats after a certain uh, number of samples. So, let us say uh, n is the uh, period of the signal correct. Let us represent the continuous signal first say this is x of t and let us say that this is a simple signal sign signal like this right and when it is discretized we will have uh, x of n like this and uh, let us suppose that the signal is like this ok. So, let us say this is the signal. So, we have this is uh, say uh, the sample 0 then 1 2 and then this goes up to n minus 1 right. So, and this step the interval between time interval between every uh, two consecutive samples is basically delta t right and then the sample uh, the time period of the signal is t correct. So, and here we see that t is basically equal to n into delta t. So, here therefore, n is the period of the signal in terms of the number of samples and t is the uh, capital T is the time period of the signal. Uh, and here uh, you know we are saying that x n is periodic. So, therefore, now we start from the frequency uh, you know domain representation of a continuous periodic signal. So, for a continuous periodic signal uh, we already know from the Fourier analysis that uh, the kth frequency component right we can write as c k is equal to 1 by t integration of uh, integration over 0 to t that is one time period and then x of t e to the power minus i k omega naught t dt. So, this is the expression we got uh, you know in the in one of the previous lectures earlier where we considered the frequency domain representation of a continuous periodic signal right and then we develop uh, the complex form of the Fourier series expansion ok. So, this is nothing but this is from the complex form of the Fourier series expansion uh, 
and now what we are going to do because the signal in the you know present case is discrete now we are going to incorporate modifications in various variables right in this expression uh, uh, to account for the uh, discrete nature of the signal okay so um, uh, now what are those modifications so what we see is that um, the time t okay it is no longer continuous but it is discrete so we can write t uh, the time you know instant of any particular sample of the signal as n times delta t right so if i substitute n is equal to 0 i get the uh, time you know instant of the first sample uh, then if i substitute n is equal to 1 i get the time instant of the second sample and if i substitute a small n is equal to capital n minus 1 i get the time instant of the last sample that is the nth sample uh, then we also have the fundamental frequency omega naught uh, we know that this is equal to 2 pi upon the time period t and in our case this would be uh, t is nothing but n times delta t uh, t already we have written the expression t capital t the time period is nothing but equal to number of samples n multiplied by the time resolution or time gap delta t uh, the other uh, thing is that the dt it is an infinite simul you know time uh, length right uh, so in the present case this infinite simul time length uh, you know this uh, would become a finite time step delta t right so this uh, basically uh, should be then replaced by delta t right and then because we have a finite number of uh, discrete number of samples the signal is no longer continuous so we cannot integrate the signal uh, you know treating it as a continuous signal so the sign of integration has to be replaced by sign of summation because the samples are discrete they are finite in number and we can carry out a finite summation therefore integration 0 to capital T has to be you know replaced by summation right over the number of samples and those samples would be varying from n is equal to 0 to n minus 1 right and let us also represent the co coefficient c k uh, by a new symbol let us say capital x k so since small x we are using it to represent the discrete signal right in the time domain we are using the capital x uh, to represent the frequency domain representation of the signal that is the signal in the frequency domain so now if we incorporate these modifications in the this expression then uh, let us uh, go to the next page and now we can write down let us write down the expression for ck again so we have 1 upon t integration from 0 to capital t uh, we have x of t into e to the power minus i uh, k omega naught t into dt right now ck we represented by x of k right and capital t is nothing but n into delta t then integration is replaced by summation over the samples from 0 to n minus 1 x of t uh, would no longer be a continuous signal but it is a discrete signal so we, we will represent it by x of n right into e to the power minus i k omega naught is nothing but 2 pi upon time period t and time period t was nothing but n into delta t right and small t is the discrete time instant and that is nothing but small n into delta t right and dt is nothing but the finite time step delta t so we see from here that this delta t cancels out and then we are left with 1 by n n is equal to 0 to n minus 1 x of n e to the power minus i k 2 pi by n into n because this delta t also cancels out from here right um, and then this is nothing but x of k so this is the expression we are now getting for x of k okay and here uh, k uh, basically are the uh, k is the index of the frequency component right and k can vary from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity all those components so i can have minus 2 then minus 1 
then 0, then 1, then 2 and like this it will go up to infinity. Therefore, using this expression I can find the value of xk for k varying from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, xk essentially represents the frequency domain representation of the discrete signal x of n, right. Therefore, xk represents a frequency domain representation of discrete signal x of n, right. And uh, this is called discrete Fourier series, okay. So, this is referred as discrete Fourier series, right. And here uh, the amplitudes x k, they are basically complex. The amplitude x k is complex, that is it has magnitude and phase. Okay. Uh, let us uh, look at a very important property of this discrete Fourier series, which we are going to abbreviate as DFS, right. There is a very important property of DFS, right, and that property is that the discrete Fourier series is periodic. Let us try to look at that why discrete Fourier series is periodic. So, we are going to now look at and study the periodicity of DFS, the discrete Fourier series. Let us look at Rth and R plus Nth frequency components. So, uh, we got the expression for xk. So, if you substitute k is equal to r, we can find xr and we can write that as 1 by n summation from n is equal to 0 uh, to n minus 1, right, and then x of n into d to the power minus i. So, now in place of k, we have to write r. So, r into 2 by 2 pi by capital N into small n, right. Uh, so, this is the expression. Uh, and similarly, for x r plus n, we can write down 1 by n, n is equal to 0 to n minus 1, x n e to the power minus i r plus n 2 pi by n into n, right. And this I can write as uh, 1 upon n, n is equal to 0 to n minus 1, right, into uh, x n e to the power minus i r 2 pi by n into small n into, right, uh, uh, minus e to the power minus i n. 2 pi by n into small n, right. And therefore, this quantity uh, is, if you look at this quantity, and this quantity is nothing but e to the power minus i 2 pi n, right. And this is always equal to 1 uh, because n is integer. Since n is integer, e to the power minus i 2 pi n is always 1. And therefore, this expression, uh, the, uh, the coefficient x, uh, x r plus n becomes n equal to 0 to n minus 1 x n uh, e to the power minus i r 2 pi upon capital N into small n. This is x r plus n. So, what is the intuition? We see that x r plus n in fact has turned out to be same as x r. This is nothing but equal to x r. So, x r plus n is actually equal to x r, right. So, this shows that and this is true for any r because we have not taken any specific r here, r is general. Therefore, we see that the frequency components whose indices are separated by capital N 
they are identical right their uh, amplitude is identical uh, so if i take let us say uh, k uh, from if i look at the first n components okay then they are k is equal to uh, 0 then 1 then 2 up to n minus 1 so what are these these are the first n components okay uh, and then if i take further right if i go further uh, say n then n plus 1 going up to say to n minus 1 so these are next n components right and in this way i can uh, go further right uh, so so uh, because of the result we got previously that is x r plus n is equal to x r uh, so all these next n components they will be identical to the first n components so this next n components they are going to be same as first n components we got so from here we see that the discrete fourier series is periodic it is periodic okay and what is the periodicity of the discrete fourier series if you look at the frequency components you are getting right so if i look at k is equal to 0 1 2 up to n minus 1 then the, what are the corresponding frequency components the frequency components are 2 pi upon n delta t okay uh, into 0 that is the frequency of the first component then i have 1 into 2 pi upon n delta t that is the frequency of the next frequency component and this would go up to n minus 1 into 2 pi upon n delta t that is the frequency of the last frequency component and the next frequency component would be n into 2 pi n delta t correct and therefore the periodicity uh, in the frequency domain right uh, would be simply uh, n into 2 pi upon n delta t which basically means that 2 pi into the sampling frequency which is nothing but the sampling frequency in radians per second so it means after uh, mm, a frequency range which is whose higher frequency is omega s after that the frequency uh, spectrum would repeat the discrete fourier series would repeat therefore we see that discrete fourier series dfs has and distinct frequency components okay uh, and therefore these end distinct components they are basically they form the frequency domain representation of the discrete periodic symbol right and these components form the frequency domain representation of the discrete periodic signal uh, and then uh, the k uh, we can also take from say I can uh, take uh, from minus n by 2 then minus n by 2 plus 1 going up to 0 then 1 then 2 going up to n by 2 minus 1 so i can take this uh, uh, indices k uh, from minus n by 2 to n by 2 uh, minus 1 okay this also can be taken so but then you can see these are also again n components these are also essentially a total n components uh, now this uh, n components they also have a uh, certain dependency okay in terms of the uh, their magnitude and phase right they are they are related to each other so let us look at that uh, so um, relationship 
among Fourier coefficients of DFS. Let us look at these relationships, right. Uh, so, uh, first relationship we got was that x uh, n plus k is equal to x k, right. So, the component k and n plus k uh, they have same you know amplitude. Now, if I take k uh, as minus k, then I can write this relationship simply as n x n minus k is equal to x minus k, right. And from the um, discrete Fourier series expression, we can easily see that that x minus k is essentially complex conjugate of the x k, correct. So, x minus k is complex conjugate of uh, x k. And therefore, uh, if I combine these two uh, you know equations, then we can simply say that x n minus k is equal to x uh, k complex conjugate, right. So, this is another relationship we get, okay. And uh, uh, what is meaning of this? This basically shows that the magnitude of x n minus k is same as magnitude of uh, no, x k, right. And the phase of x n minus k is equal to minus of phase of x k, right. Now, what is the consequence of this property? That the magnitude spectrum of DFS is symmetric and the consequence of this uh, is that the phase spectrum is asymmetric. So, to get insight into the nature of uh, the magnitude and phase spectrum, uh, let us take a small example. Let us say that the discrete signal has 4 samples, right. And now, if we find the DFS, then we will have uh, 4 distinct frequency components that we will get. And those frequency components would be frequency components in DFS. Uh, what would they be? X0, then we will have X1, then X2, and X3. These are the components we will have, right? K varying from, uh, so uh, this is if I write k here, so k is equal to zero, k is equal to one, k is equal to two, and k is equal to three, right? So those are the components we will have. Uh, now let us look at the nature of these components, right? So if we look at let's say x naught, so if uh, we have the relationship that x minus k is equal to uh, x k star x minus k and x uh, is basically complex conjugate of x k, right. So, if I take k is equal to 0, then what do I get? We get x 0 is equal to x star 0. So, uh, x naught is nothing but complex conjugate of itself. So, that can happen only when x naught is real, it cannot be complex. So, x naught is uh, real, that is the conclusion. Uh, let us now look at uh, uh, the relationship x we had n minus k right is equal to x star k this also relationship we just got previously right. So, if we take now k is equal to 1 here, so what we see? We see that 4 minus 1 is equal to x star 1 which means that x 3 is equal to x star 1. So, this shows that the third frequency component, it is complex conjugate of the first frequency component, right. So, let us see for k is equal to 2, we know that x n minus k is equal to x star k, right. 
So if I take k is equal to 2 and n is equal to 4, then this is x2 is equal to x x2 star. So this again shows that uh, the x2 is basically real. Right? Let us also look at this relationship x n minus k is equal to uh, x k star when k is equal to 0. Then what do we get? We get x4 because n is 4 is equal to x star 0 and because x uh, x0 is real, so we can simply write this as x0. So x4 is equal to x0. So therefore, what we see, if we look at now the components x0, x1, x2, x3, so these are the n distinct components we have and the next component in the next part of the you know period would be x4. right? So what we see now, if you uh, you know use the results we got, then this is nothing but x naught, then x one, and then we have x two, and then x three is nothing but the complex conjugate. Now x three is nothing but complex conjugate of x one, right? So I can replace x three by x one star, and x four is nothing but x naught. So I, I get this, right? So therefore, what we see from here that the spectrum is symmetric. The magnitude, if you look at now, if I look at the magnitude, then that is nothing but x naught, then x one magnitude, then x two magnitude, and this is nothing but magnitude of x one itself because the x1 and its complex conjugate will have the same magnitude and then I have x0. And what we see? Now we see that this is symmetric. With respect to sample x2, right? So that is what is basically the meaning of the uh, statement we, we made previously that the uh, magnitude spectrum of DFS is symmetric. So in this case, we can see that this is symmetric, and if you look at the phase, right? Then the you can see the phase is basically asymmetric. It is very clear from here that uh, because x two and x naught they are real, while x one and x three they are complex conjugate of each other, and therefore they have a, a phase which differs by one eighty degree. So it's asymmetric. Uh, let us now look at uh, the inverse discrete Fourier series. So once we obtain the uh, Fourier coefficients x k, then uh, how can we construct or reconstruct or regenerate the um, uh, discrete sequence or discrete time signal? Right, that can be done using inverse Fourier series. Uh, to obtain an expression for inverse uh, you know discrete Fourier series, uh, we again will start from the corresponding expression uh, based on the continuous time signal. And uh, uh, for the uh, for the continuous time signal x of t is equal to c k into the power i k omega not t right with k varying from minus infinity to plus infinity so this is the complex form of fourier series expansion okay and now here we are going to incorporate the modifications in various variables here uh, taking into account the discrete nature of the signal and therefore now x of t uh, we we can simply represent as now discrete signal right xn uh, and then we have the summation. So the number of frequency components we have got, they are uh, you know n n distinct frequency components we have, and therefore we will use only those n distinct frequency components to reconstruct the signal. And hence we are going to uh, you know use uh, the um, components from k 
k is equal to uh, 0 to n minus 1 right and then in place of ck we have xk uh, representing the discrete Fourier series and then we have i k in place of omega naught we now have the frequency uh, uh, 2 pi upon n delta t right which is nothing but the time period t into now t is no longer continuous so and uh, it exists only at discrete uh, values of time and that is nothing but small n into delta t so this cancels out and then we are uh, left with x n is equal to k is equal to 0 to n minus 1 x k it is power i k 2 pi by capital n into small n so this is nothing but uh, the expression for inverse dfs so if x k is given the discrete Fourier series is given Fourier coefficients are given then we can find out or reconstruct the time sequence x n the discrete sequence x n let us now take an example uh, to understand how the magnitude spectrum in dfs looks like so example uh, let us take uh, a signal say x of t is equal to uh, 20 cos 2 pi 2 t plus 14 cos 2 pi 60. So, let us say this uh, describes the signal we are measuring this equation describes the signal we are measuring and we see that this consists of there are two frequency components uh, the one frequency component exists at 2 hertz and its amplitude is 20 and another frequency component exists at 6 hertz its amplitude is 14. Uh, let us say that uh, uh, we use a sampling frequency of 20 hertz to sample the signal right and the signal is recorded over a duration of 1 second. Therefore, the number of samples would be basically equal to 20 okay, and uh, uh, the fundamental frequency of the signal is 2 pi by t which is uh, 2 pi radian per second and in terms of hertz this would be simply omega naught upon 2 pi that is 1 hertz. Okay. So, that is basically going to be the uh, uh, frequency resolution between two consecutive frequency components, the frequency gap between two consecutive frequency components. Now, what we do is that we compute DFS and uh, we know that the periodicity of DFS that would be basically equal to uh, 20 hertz the periodicity that is which is basically equal to the uh, sampling frequency fs okay uh, and now we compute the uh, frequency components in dfs and uh, we can now compute uh, if you take the indices from say minus n by 2 to 0 1 going up to n by 2 minus 1 right and since uh, n is 20 we are going to compute it from minus 10 minus 9 0 1 2 up to 9 so the corresponding frequency components would be the frequencies would be uh, minus 10 hertz right minus 9 hertz going up to 9 hertz like this uh, so that is basically the one period of DFS and then similarly we can then uh, find out from say 10 hertz to 30 hertz will be the second period. So we can go from say then 10, 11 up to uh, 29 hertz that will be the second period of DFS and so on that will be basically repeating. So, if we show it on the, uh, on the graph of, so this is nothing but now the 
uh, magnitude of DFS and here we are showing the frequency in hertz. So the uh, we are going therefore going to have on the spectrum from minus 10 to uh, 9 hertz so then and the next sample will be at 10 hertz. So now we are going to basically have uh, the one component that would appear here would be at 2 hertz okay and similarly at minus 2 hertz like this and the amplitude of this component would be 10 and similarly there will be another component at 6 hertz and at minus 6 hertz and the amplitude of this component would be 7. And then what will happen if we compute from 10 to 29 hertz then um, that would appear that would be repetition of this spectrum from minus 10 to plus 10. So uh, uh, we will have from say let us suppose this is let me extend axis further like this and now let me show this is now 20, 30 hertz right. So now we are going to have a component at uh, here corresponding to uh, 6 hertz. Uh, so this component of course is at repetition right. So this will be at um, a higher frequency and then we have spectrum like this. Similarly on this side uh, also it will repeat okay like this so therefore this is essentially the one period of the dfs and this basically repeats so in this way we come to the end of the lecture and today we have discussed uh, the frequency domain representation of discrete periodic signals. Thank you.